Good morning. morning. God is good, isn't he? And all the time? Amen. Several people mentioned we're going to talk about community. And we live in such an individualistic society, narcissistic society, self-centered society, that we, we tend to view Scripture through those same lenses. And we read everything in terms of me individually. And we forget that it was much more of a holistic society back then where your sense of relationships and community were very important. And much of what God, we're going to see much of what God gives to us, he gives to us through the channel of community and relationships. Um, So we're going to, how many of you know that your, your faith in God ultimately cannot be separated from your relationship with others? We try to do that, but you, you cannot. How can you fulfill the promises that, uh, and the uh, commands that deal with loving one another if you isolate yourself from one another? You can't love one another. You can't serve one another. You can't uh, agree with one another. And when you became a part of the new creation of Christ, you became part of the new community of God. The new nature that we have in Christ is actually much, most fully expressed by the word love. And that means involvement in one another's lives. And so we're going to look at some of these uh, aspects. You have in your notes the first passage which I want to read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning of verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And the, you keep finding the word stand. Stand firm. Stand your ground. Stand against the enemy. Uh, basically, the, one who's, the last man standing is the one who wins. God, God says, I want you to be able to stand against the assault of the enemy. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, and it will come, there will be those days when the assault of the enemy seems overwhelming, that you will be able to stand your ground and after having done everything, to stand. Firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The title of the message is Stand Strong, Stand Together. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you would enable us to stand firm, to stand strong, to stand our ground to stand against the enemy, to stand together, because it's only together that we're going to be able to withstand and stand against the assault of the enemy. Open our ears to hear from your spirit this morning. We humble our heart before you and invite you to speak to us about this very important subject. May Christ be honored, we pray. Amen. Amen. There are two attitudes that we need to guard against when it comes to the subject of spiritual, uh, uh, spiritual warfare. We've been talking about this for several weeks and the armor of God. And one of the attitudes we need to guard against is, is kind of a, a casual, careless attitude that regards lightly this subject of spiritual warfare. How many of you know we're in a battle? We're in a war, a very real war with very real casualties. We cannot afford to be naive uh, and oblivious to the battle that's raging around us. Jesus said of the devil that he, he, his purpose is to rob, to steal, to kill, to destroy. He wants to shipwreck your relationships. 
He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your, your children. He wants to rob us of our faith, steal our confidence in God. And it's a very real war. Now, what I've discovered is that most parents begin to take seriously the warfare when their kids reach teenage years. How many of you have uh, discovered that? You suddenly are like, oh, you know, the devil's trying to destroy my family, he's trying to destroy my kids. And the seductive lure of the world system around us uh, is used by the enemy to accomplish that. So we need to realize that countless lives are shipwrecked. People are in bondage to sin, strongholds of deception in their thinking that is not a matter of flesh and blood, but coming in the name of Jesus Christ using the spiritual armor that God has given to us. So we don't want to be casual and careless in our attitude about spiritual warfare, but we also don't want to be cocky and cavalier uh, about and sense of arrogance. Um, we need to take it seriously, but we need to realize that he, the devil is like a lion going about seeking whom he may destroy. My favorite part of the movie Gone with the Wind is a scene where the, all the gentlemen are standing around smoking and discussing whether Georgia should enter into the war that's looming on the horizon. So they, they're, they're talking and they're saying things like, the situation is very simple, gentlemen. The Yanks can't fight like we can. That's right, they'll just run and turn and run. One, one Southerner can lick 20 Yanks. Yeah, we'll finish the war in one battle. And they're saying all these things, and Rhett Butler is standing on the side, just kind of taking it all in, and someone says, Rhett, what do you think about this? He says, well, I think it'll make a, I think it's that winning a war, it's hard to win a war with words. They said, what difference does that make? We're gentlemen. He said, well, I think it'll make a big difference to a great many gentlemen. Are you hinting that the Yanks can beat us? He said, no, I'm not hinting. I'm stating plainly that the Yanks are better equipped than we are. They have factories, shipyards, coal mines, and a fleet to bottle up our harbors and starve us. All, we, all we've got is cotton, slaves, and arrogance. We, wanna, we don't want to be oblivious and casual toward this subject but we don't want to be cavalier, and uh, I think that's as dangerous an attitude uh, as casual and unaware. So I think that's why the, we, Paul starts with the belt, uh, which speaks of, we looked at the belt, which tightens up all the loose areas of, of our garments, speaks of sober-mindedness, takes seriously this subject of spiritual warfare, alertness to the dangers that are ahead of us, and a disciplined lifestyle. Last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness, which guards our heart against the accusation of the enemy, uh, the righteousness that we have in Christ, the coming before the throne of grace boldly, and drawing near to God with a good conscience. Now, this morning we're looking at what is probably the most disputed or ambiguous of the different pieces of armor as far as interpreting how it applies to us. Um, Bible commentators are kind of all over the map on this. So I'm going to share the correct view <laughs> in humility. Now, I'm going to share what I see in this, but you need to be aware that there are a number of different views. The, uh, it says, uh, having your feet fitted 
with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's kind of an awkward statement. Um, What does that mean, having your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? Well, it brings us to the footwear that the Roman soldier would wear. How many of you know having the right footwear for the right uh, task is very important? Uh, I just heard, I don't know how many of you have heard, one of the latest women's exercise craze, crazes is what's called heel hop. They do exercises and calisthenics in high heels, which is, I can't comprehend. I don't even know how you can walk in them, let alone you know, exercise in them. Um, but that just doesn't seem like the right footwear for what you're doing. Well, the Romans were very careful about their footwear. They marched for hundreds of miles. They needed footwear that was durable, that was comfortable, and that was practical. One blister can kill you for miles uh, trying to walk on that. So that was very important. They took a heavy leather sole and attached leather straps around the ankles and attached it to the foot. But the most notable thing about the footwear of the, or boots of the Roman soldier was at the bottom of the uh, footwear was embedded into the leather metal studs or metal spikes. Now the reason for that would be obvious. That's to give you greater traction uh, while you're fighting. You could be the most skilled warrior You could be the most powerful soldier. You could be the best equipped, have the best weapons. But it's all for naught if you can't keep your your balance. If you're slipping, if you're on your back, the enemy has a definite advantage over you. So footwear was very important. It was important for traction. It was important for stability. It was important to be sure-footed, to stand your ground against the enemy. So everyone's pretty much agreed on that. But what are the boots? If the belt is truth, the breastplate is righteousness, what are the boots? What does that speak of? Well, he says the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The word readiness means literally established on a firm foundation, which is what we've been saying about sure foot, sure-footedness in fighting. Uh, so this phrase, the gospel of peace, what does that mean? Well, I don't think it just means, I think it, it means sharing the gospel, but I don't think it just means proclaiming the gospel or sharing the gospel um, or would have phrased it more that way. He uses a curious phrase, the gospel of peace, uh, which is the only time he's ever called that. Uh, And I don't think he means just understanding the gospel message uh, because we just dealt with that in the the the, uh, breastplate and we deal with it again in the helmet of salvation and so on. So I... uh, what I, I think what I've, I've helps me is that this word peace is used in a particular way by the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. It is used seven other times in the book of Ephesians, and every one of those times it refers to not the peace we have with God, but the peace that we have with others, the peace and harmony and unity that we walk together in. Um, but again, we individualist, we tend to view it individualistically, and so we, we apply it that way. Now, certainly applies in our relationship with God. We have peace with God uh, because we're justified by faith in Christ. But the, let me just give you a few of the References in, of peace in Ephesians says words like this. Uh, 2.14, for he himself is our peace 
who has made the two one. That is the two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, how many of you know there's always two groups of people that have this dividing wall and they can't get along? It may be whether it's Jew or Gentile, men or women, black and white, rich and poor, young and old, charismatic, evangelical, conservative, liberal. Uh, we've, we've always got the two groups that we take sides. And Christ himself is our peace who has made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. He himself is our peace. Ephesians 2.15, his purpose was to create in himself one new man, that is the church, out of the two, the Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to those who were far away, the Gentiles, to those who were near, the Jews. Um, and so on. Make every effort to keep the unity of, the, of this, the spirit through the bond of peace. And uh, you begin to realize that many times when Paul is saying you, he means you, plural, not just you, singular. So I understand the gospel of peace to mean not only that uh, the peace we have with God because of the gospel, but the peace that we have with one another. And that's the approach I'm going to take this. Let me say it this way. The miracle of salvation is not just that God took a fallen humanity and reconciled us together to him. The miracle of salvation is that he took a divided humanity and reconciled us together with one another. I've often mentioned the cross has two dimensions. It has a vertical dimension which speaks of our relationship to God and it has a horizontal dimension which speaks of our reconciliation with one another through the cross of Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus died to break down the dividing wall not only between us and God, but between uh, us, whatever two, two groups are to you. So in every other use of the word peace in Ephesians, he, it's peace with others and the, and the um, unity and harmony that come with it. In fact, the word peace, shalom, is the Old Testament word in Hebrew, which the basic essence is that we are brought into a relationship of peace and harmony that produces favor and blessing with God, with others, and with ourselves. So it's the good news that we are at peace with God and peace with one another. And then the Apostle Paul is saying, stand firm. If you're going to Stand firm in the evil day. Stand your ground against the schemes of the enemy. Stand sure-footed in the battle. Then you need to stand together. If we do not stand together, we will fall alone. Ecclesiastes says if, if, if there are two and one falls, then he has someone to help him get up. But if we are alone uh, and we fall, then woe to that man, for he has no one to help him get back up. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 to 28, because this uh, deals with this aspect of standing together in spiritual warfare, which causes us to not be alarmed by our opponents, overwhelmed in, or fearful and frightened, because we are striving together, fighting together, and we are standing together. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, how you walk in Christ needs to be comparable to who you are in Christ. It needs to correspond to the uh, lofty, high calling that we have in Christ. Our walk ought to correspond to that. How do we conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ? By standing together together standing firm in one spirit, and striving together. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
in no way alarmed by your opponents. Paul is not writing to a group of people who are sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya. This is, this is a group of people who are in the pressure cooker of conflict and opposition and persecution. And so the Apostle Paul says, in this, you need to, to strive together, stand together. The only hope you have is standing firm against the opposition, and that means standing together. But very often, instead of standing together, we, we, we fight one another. And instead of realizing that the enemy is out there, the enemy gets us to think that we're the enemy and fighting one another. I heard a story, I don't know, I don't know if this is accurate or what, there's a lot of things you pick up on the internet. But uh, the difference between thoroughbred horses and donkeys is that when thoroughbred horses are uh, attacked or threatened, say by lions that were surrounding them, they would put their head, they'd form a circle, put their heads in the middle so that they can kick outward with their feet if any uh, threat or enemy comes against them. Donkeys, guess what donkeys do? They form a circle and they put their feet together and their heads facing out and kick each other. <laughs> That's why they're called donkeys. That's and I think that's what we do. That's what we do all the time. You know, we, we kick one another. Well, we're not the enemy. The enemy, when the enemy comes between us, between our relationships, then we think one another that we're the enemies. And many times in counseling, I have to get a couple, to, instead of looking at each other as the enemy, I need to get them both to turn and look, look, that, that issue that problem is the thing that's destroying your marriage. You need to look at that and realize that's your enemy is trying to destroy you. So very often what happens in well, instead of striving together, we're attacking one another. Now I want to share with you about the power, the provision, and the protection that is found in the community, uh, found in our relationships together. Uh, there is a certain sense where the power of God is available in, in the context of community that isn't as available indiv individually. And some of you sort of, well, I'm, I, just, I just claim it. You know, we all want to be like Elijah, who was kind of off on his own and uh, walk into town and declare the Word of God and call down fire from heaven and, and so on. The fact is, in the new covenant, God has put us as part of a community, which is the very, the new man, the body of Christ. And uh, there is certain power in the in community that you won't be able to apprehend individually. There's a certain protection in the community that you don't have individually. There is a certain provision in the community that we don't have individually. So let me look, let's look at a couple of verses. The first thing, there is a blessing found uniquely in community that you don't have individually. There's a certain blessing, and we, we, can, we experience that when we come to church. Part of that is the, the we, there's a certain blessing we get when we meet together with others that we don't get just by locking ourselves in our room at home, and so on. Psalm 133, verse 1 and 3. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. More accurately, for there the Lord commands his blessing. Uh, it's almost as though God says, blessing, I command you. There's a, there's a group of brothers and sisters walking together in unity, and I command the blessing to be there. There's a blessing that's found uniquely in community. There's, there's an authority that is found uniquely in community. Uh, and this sort of came home to me in a, in a whole new 
way as I was preparing this message. Um, I've always taught on the importance of community, but I saw it in a sense that we sometimes lose and not realize how powerful the authority of the body of Christ really is. Matthew 16, 17 to 19, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He's talking about the church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it, there is a certain authority that the church has to deliver captives, those who have been captive and held bondage. Uh, And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There's a certain authority that the church has to open the kingdom of God to people or to close the kingdom of God to people. And uh, the, Jesus said this to the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you, don't, you, you, you yourselves don't go into the kingdom of God, and you don't let anybody else into the kingdom of God. And Peter, as a representative of the ch- church and giving the keys, says that as a church body, there is an authority you have. If you're living out the kingdom life and modeling that, it will be an open door to bring others into the kingdom. If you are not representing the kingdom of God, you will keep people from the kingdom because the church is the representative of Christ on the earth. And Peter used those keys on the, uh, after uh, uh, to open the door to the Gentiles to come into the church. And uh, then it was ultimately ratified by the church. And God has given an authority that's found uniquely in the community. Now here's, here's where it gets a little more practical. The next verse I want to look at, passage, is in James chapter 4. If there is, in fact, a a sense of authority in the body of Christ, in the community of God, then we want to take advantage of that. There's certainly individual prayer is important and, uh, and so on, but we need to grab hold of one another, pray for one another. Say, I'm going through a battle and uh, I'm starting to lose my, my footing. Can you pray with me? Can you help me? And... Uh, there is, there is power in that. He says, James 5, 14, 16, is any one of you sick? Well, let him go into his closet and pray for healing. Now, that's fine to do that, but that's not what he says. He says, if, is any of you sick? Then call for the elders of the church. Why the elders? Because the elders are so spiritual and God always answers their prayers. No, it doesn't say that. The elders, it's not because of who the elders are, it's because of what they, what they represent. They are the representatives of the church of God. And so, if you come in faith to the elders, if you come to the elders, you're acting in faith with the word of God. And uh, I think that's something that we haven't taken advantage of as much. We, we often have the elders come forward and some other people to pray I mean, encourage people to come forward for prayer. Prayer. I think if we, if we understood the power of prayer in community, people would run down the aisle to get here. So we'll, I've, been praying, I've been praying for healing for this for a long time and, and praying in my closet just hasn't done it. I need to have the elders pray for me. I need to have the leaders pray for me. I need to have the, uh, to agree with someone about this and, and find God's channel of power. Call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith. What is the prayer offered in faith? It is the prayer of the elders as requested by the person who goes to the elders as a step of faith. It takes faith um, 
to go to the elders and say, I, I believe you're representative of the, the authority of the church, and I'm going to ask you to pray for me. Uh, and then he goes on to say, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. And there is power in community confessing, not the whole community, but saying, listen, I'm struggling with this. And this temptation is getting the best of me. And I need somebody to stand together with me and pray so I can stand against the enemy because I'm losing my footing. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There is also, thirdly, a, a, there is the presence of, of Christ found uniquely in community. And this is very closely related to what we just said. Matthew 18, 19 to 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. Now, I've often said that Jesus is kind of makes me chuckle because it's Jesus saying, if, if I can get just two of you to agree on something, then I'll, I'll personally show up for that. I don't, <laughs> he's saying, if I can get two, why two? After that, he says, if two or three of you have gathered together in my name, they are mine in the midst. Why does he say two and then two or three? Well, he's saying more than one. And the only thing ruled out is one. Uh, he said, I'm talking about, there's a place for one, but I'm talking about two or three or a group of people that's in community where, uh, he says, if you'll, my presence will be there in a, in a unique way that you won't experience in your personal devotions, my power will be there to answer prayer in a way that won't be there during your devotional times. Now, during your devotional times, pray. I pray on your own. I'm not saying we don't pray on our own. I'm saying that the, the outlook of the scripture is that there's a certain authority and a certain answer to prayer and a certain presence of Jesus Christ and a certain empowerment that comes and authority that comes from uh, the community that we, where we stand together and strive together. The last thing, there is a protection found uniquely in community. Isaiah 59, 19, familiar to many of you, when the, the, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God raises up a standard against him. Now, in those days, they, they had, throughout Israel, there were wadis, they call them, W-A-D-I. They were stream beds that were often dry and nothing in them because it was a very hot, dry climate. But sometimes you would have a storm that would take place in the elevations surrounding these wadis, and they, they would fill, water would pour down and fill these wadis uh, with an overwhelming force as the water rushed through. Uh, we, we sort of got a little taste of that. My family and I went to Utah to Zion National Park, which is a, a, a tremendous experience. But the best of the, uh, our time there was we went through a canyon. The Virgin River went through this narrow canyon. The canyon was about as wide as this church. And the walls of the canyon went straight up for 800 to 1,000 feet. They just went straight up. And so you got to walk in the uh, Virgin River. It was about up to your chest. And you, it was in the hot summer day. It was so refreshing. You're walking through the river, and these, these and this canyon walls go straight up. Um, but they will not, if there's, if there's any chance of rains in the elevations above, they will not let you through. Because this water, which is six feet high, five feet high, can, in a matter of moments, swell to 50, 100 feet high. And many people would be caught in that. And the flow of the water, the rush of the water, 
uh, and the overwhelmingness of the water is the picture that is, is being conveyed here but in Isaiah 59, 19. Have you ever had the enemy come in like that? It's like you were just, this is refreshing, I'm doing fine, and then suddenly the water rushes through, overwhelms you, and the enemy comes in like that, and we feel overwhelmed. But when we're overwhelmed, the Spirit of God raises up a standard. Now, what does that mean? This, uh, the standard was a, a large object, usually a, a banner of some type, and in the, middle of, in the midst of the battle, very often your army would be scattered and, uh, and you can't win the battle unless you're fighting it together. So the standard bearer would look for elevated ground where he could put the standard and everyone would be looking for the standard. Um, and when I saw the standard, that would be the rallying point. Everybody would rally to that so that together we can regroup and fight. Otherwise, we'll be uh, divided and ineffective. Well, the standard for Christians is Jesus Christ. He's the one around whom we uh, war and labor and serve and so on. He's the standard. Um, and his body, the, the church, is the rallying point around which we find renewed protection as we fight together. The other thing I'll mention, and then we'll wrap this up, about the protection that's in the body, the, Paul talked about on several occasions turning a person over to Satan. And most commentators would say that's referring to um, excommunication, where someone would is just not regarded as a, a brother or sister in Christ. They, they, their lifestyle, their attitude, and everything just says, well, we have to put you out of the church, which means you're no longer under the covering of the church. You're out there sort of on your own against... And the enemy will take advantage of that. So he, it's so serious to him that to be out from under the covering of the church is to be turned over to Satan. But whatever, whatever that means, at the very least, it means that there's a certain protective um, covering that comes from being part of the church of Jesus Christ. And there's a certain protection in that. So we don't want to isolate ourselves from the means that God has given to us for protection. I wrap it up with this. There's a little chart there. God's plan for his people in the church is that we walk together in unity, that we serve together in ministry, that we grow together in maturity, and that we are fitted together in community. Those four things are essential. It's not just a matter of attending a Sunday morning service. It's a matter of walking together in unity, serving together in ministry, growing together in maturity, fitted together in community. And so Satan's schemes for God's people is, number one, keep them divided. Because if they're divided, they're, they're, not, they're fighting each other instead of fighting the devil. Keep them uninvolved rather than serving in ministry which makes them ineffective in spiritual warfare. Keep them immature because then they're tossed to and fro uh, and of, of no real threat to the kingdom and keep them isolated so that they're not being fitted in relationships together in the community of God. I close with this quote from Stephen Micaiah in his book, becoming a healthy church. We live in a narcissistic age, a period of history marked by self-centeredness and relational challenges. How many would agree with that? I think we, we certainly have all experienced that. The world around us promotes values that pull us further into ourselves and farther from one another. 
The Church of Jesus Christ must counter this phenomenon, presenting an alternative that breathes life and hope into the hearts of lonely, confused, disenfranchised, hurting people. I've come through my study in preparing for this to a greater appreciation of my brothers and sisters in Christ, of the church, of the community of God. Um, and I hope God has sort of opened your eyes to, to that as well. So let's uh, ask the worship team if they would join me on the platform here. And what I'd like us to do after we receive communion, because I always try to apply the word, if we can apply it at this moment, rather than so well, we'll get around to it in a couple of weeks. I think what I'd like to do is after we take communion, after the serving of communion, we'll open up, we'll, uh, like some of the elders and, and uh, individuals who come up to pray, and give you that opportunity to come forward to pray. We'll do that after communion. Let's just have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your community of faith, your brothers and sisters who are part of the body of Christ. And we, we just, we've, we've become scattered as an army. And I pray that you would raise up the standard that we would rally around it, regroup, and find a renewed standing together and firm footing against the enemy. We thank you for your word. Encourage our hearts. Strengthen our hands. Remind us that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The word communion means the relationships that we have in community. And I'd like us to view it from that perspective, that we are his body. And in taking communion, we are sharing the unity that we have in Christ. Paul said, do all, everything possible to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so we give thanks that because of the sacrifice of Christ, that we stand before him, justified, righteous, clean, at peace with God and with one another. So let's receive communion with that understanding. Yeshua is going to distribute the bread. If you would hold your, your peace until everyone is received, then we'll all partake together.
Bible says, is not the cup of blessing which we bless, 